the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, Unconventional American SBGs, Triathlon, Supersonic Casts with Unguided Arms, and Metal Beasts, One Step Away from the Panther. We'd like to continue talking about the new vehicles brought to you by the Drone Age update. Two episodes ago, we discussed the Japanese prototype Wheeler, and today we have another prototype, but this time it's one of the most famous German World War II tanks. Please welcome the Panther prototype, the VK-3002M. Its main caliber is a 75mm gun with elevation angles between minus 8 and plus 20 degrees. It's also equipped with a coaxial machine gun and smoke grenade launchers. The engine compartment is in the rear, while the transmission is in front. The crew count is 5, and it follows the classic 3 plus 2 layout. Despite belonging to the medium tank class, the Panthers perform nothing like them. Their mass and frontal armor are comparable to heavy machines of other nations. At the same time, their mighty guns and sluggish turret rotation, especially on the D model, often force them to behave like classic SPGs. The VK-3002 shows performance that's a bit closer to classic medium tanks. Its armor is much thinner. The hull front can be penetrated even by the American 76mm and the Soviet 57mm cannons. Angling isn't too helpful here either. The sides are too thin. However, this prototype is lighter than the Panther and thus much more agile. Previous models never had any issues with their top speeds, and this one also received an improved acceleration rate so crucial in battle. While the VK-3002 is definitely not a heavy, it might pass as an SPG. The reason is its turret drive. It's so slow you can forget that you even have a turret. You'll simply have to use hull aiming all the time if you want to get a good chance at hitting your targets. By the way, the reverse is just as sluggish. You're unlikely to get to cover in case of danger. Crawling is the better word for it. With all of this in mind, choose your firing positions with extra care, or even the smokes won't save you. What's good about the prototype is its main caliber. It's the good old Panther gun, the 75mm long-barreled cannon with excellent ballistics. Its capped rounds can penetrate any tank front you might see in combat. The ordnance could use more explosives, of course, and some targets might require a finishing blow, but that's just us nitpicking. The gun does its job just fine. The VK-3002 performance favors long-range combat, just like with an SPG. This way, you can maximize its advantages and minimize the disadvantages. The Second World War was the palmy period for self-propelled guns. And of course, the Germans were the ones putting the most effort into them. No other nation had such a variety of SPG types, from self-propelled howitzers to tank destroyers. While other countries had tanks as the most widespread tracked vehicles, Nazi Germany chose the Stug III assault gun for the title bearer. And they had their fair reasons for this too. Number one, self-propelled guns were cheaper. The Stug III we just mentioned was 20,000 Reichsmarks cheaper than the Panzer IV, despite having similar firepower and armor. Number two, an SPG could pack more punch than tanks. Try to fit a 105mm howitzer into the turret of, say, the Panzer III. Meanwhile, the Stug 44 had no issues driving it around. Why? The answer's simple. An assault gun has no turret range. That's why Germany, the USSR, and many other nations used casemates in their SPGs. The Americans, however, chose a different path. Their popular self-propelled guns could boast full-fledged turrets. So we can't help but ask, why would someone even need such machines? 
On the one hand, the United States could afford building expensive SPGs with unique chassis. But what's the point when there's a smooth production flow for the Shermans? Among other things, it was different from its counterparts, thanks to its extra-large turret ring. No less than 1,750 millimeters. If you need something for scale, the heavy IS-2, with its enormous cannon, had a turret ring that was only 50 millimeters wider. That's why the Sherman was so good as a platform for heavier calibers. So why reinvent the wheel when you can just take a good tank and change it a little? That's how the American engineers started their work. They made the armor thinner, removed the unnecessary coaxial machine gun, and installed a new open turret. It had no turret platform or electric drive, and the open top provided an excellent view. Seems like the job was done, huh? But later on, they did in fact try to reinvent the wheel. Thinner armor made this SPG vulnerable to anti-tank rifles, so they had to make it thicker again. One would think they'd simply bring back the regular Sherman hull. But no, the American engineers were not looking for simple solutions. They designed a new base with inclined sides. That's how the M10 SPG was born. Was it worth it to create an entirely new chassis to save a couple tons? Well, maybe. Who knows? Now, the next step was the M36. Its turret armor was better, it received a hydraulic drive, and all of it made the SPG that much closer to a tank. The new 90mm main gun could damage the Panthers from the front, so the M36 played a crucial role in the Normandy invasion. The army wanted more and more of these machines. After a while, the chassis production couldn't match demand, so the M36 turrets were installed onto regular Sherman tanks. And the snake bit its own tail. The engineers went back to where they'd started. The M36 was often used as a regular tank in combat. Indeed, there was very little difference aside from the open turret. Soon after the end of the war, the Americans scrapped their turreted SPG projects. Together with the rest of the world, they learned their lesson. The best tank destroyer is another tank. we go back to rockets, good old conventional bombs, and planes that are called fighter bombers. Especially when we have such a good choice of contenders, with battle ratings between 9.7 and 10.3. Please welcome the participants. The American F-105D Thunder Chief, the Soviet Su-7BKL, the British Jaguar GR-1A, the French Mirage 5F, the Israeli Nesher, the A5C representing China, and the MiG-23 BN competing for Germany today. Some of them can carry AGMs too, but we'll do without those today. Just the good old classics. No matter what your plane is loaded with, there's no such thing as too much speed. So we'll start with our traditional race across the English Channel. The contestants line up at the start, warm up their engines, and... Go! With afterburners spewing flames, all our planes take off in mere seconds. The Chinese team didn't impress us at first, but then they started overtaking one opponent after another and took the lead above the channel. The American plane is second so far, and then we see the German and the French ones, then the Su-7 and the Nesher. The Brits lagging behind. By the middle of the race, however, the A-5 shows its lacking top speed so the MiG and the Thunder Chief start fighting for the gold. By the way, this is how they're going to finish, too. Next to reach the French coast are the Mirage and the Nesher. The Chinese fighter comes fifth, then the Su-7 and the Jaguar in dead last. The second stage will test the fighting performance of our contestants. They'll have to defeat a couple of Japanese T-2s. The first to report success are the Chinese and the French pilots. Each of their missiles hit a Japanese fighter despite the attempts at dodging. The Nesher and the Jaguar spent a little more time. They managed to hit a single enemy with their missiles and had to dogfight the other one. The American fighter can carry no less than four AAMs, but their maximum overload leaves much to be desired. 
One of the Japanese pilots managed to dodge, so the F-105 pilot shortened the distance and finished with a frontal attack. The MiG's firepower is limited by its cannon. The pilot starts a dogfight right away and handles the targets after a few turns. The Soviet contestant seems to experience the most trouble. The Su-7 has no missiles, and its flight performance isn't good enough to handle the Japanese aircraft quickly. And finally, the last part, close air support. We've prepared 15 Italian MBTs and just as many Swedish IFVs for each of our teams. The MBTs are meant for bombs and the IFVs are for rockets. The contestants can reload once to switch their armament. In this stage, the A5C pilot is having the hardest time. It has the lowest payload capacity among our contenders and no ballistic computer to boot. Thanks to some good training, the Chinese pilot manages four tanks and seven IFVs with no reload required. The Israeli team had to use sight aiming too, so they failed to achieve 100% hits with both bombs and rockets. Their result is seven tanks and 10 infantry fighting vehicles. The British plane used its auxiliary systems to calculate a neat placement for its 1,000-pound bombs between the targets, destroying two MBTs with each of its four drops. Then it returned with rocket blocks and burnt up all the IFVs. The last participants had no issues handling all the rocket targets either. Some even had a few spare rockets left. The next result, with 10 tanks destroyed, is shown by the Su-7. It knocked out two targets with each of its 500 kilogram bombs. The MiG-23 performed a bit better. Its result is 12 MBTs in six bomb drops. The American and the French pilots, though, managed to destroy the most tanks, 14 each. Time to sum up. The bronze goes to the Israeli Nesher for its good speed and decent fighter performance. The silver is shared by the German MiG-23BN and the F-105D Thunder Chief. They only needed a little more to win. And the best fighter bomber in today's triathlon is the French Mirage 5F. Its advanced air-to-air -air missiles helped it stay one step ahead. Let's give our pilots some rest, shall we? Meanwhile, we'll answer some of the questions you asked us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Big Dave. How can I get different content creator decals? I've been trying to find them for a while and I can't seem to find them. Hey, Big Dave, you can get content creator decals if you make a purchase in the official War Thunder store following the author's referral link. You can find those in the description of your favorite blogger's videos. Well, at least that's where they usually are. Evan Takamitsu writes, why is the WZ, the Chinese ZSU, so powerful when shooting aircraft, often shooting down things that other AAs can't get? Hi, Evan. There are two reasons for this, a large caliber and a proximity fuse. When your round has almost 450 grams of TNT equivalent and you don't need a direct hit, knocking planes out of the sky is a piece of cake. Another question comes from nobody. When will the custom loadouts be available for Sweden? Hey, nobody. As promised, we're constantly working on adding this feature to more vehicles. The last major update added the custom loadout capability to the Swedish Vigans. Patria CRO 30L asks, will the MiG-28 paint scheme for the F-5 be available again? Hi, Patria. This camo was a gift for those who pre-ordered a set with the F-5C. It would be unfair to them if we made the MiG-28 skin available again, wouldn't it? What you can do is find it on the live War Thunder website and download it for free. And the last comment for today was written by Georg Frenzel. How many locusts or M22s do you need to tow the Doom Turtle, the T95? Hello, Georg. Not a lot, really. Only one is enough, actually. All you need is to get it moving and the turtle will start rolling on its own. As long as the transmission is unlocked, of course. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. 
and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to grease your turtle, leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.